Good evening, everybody. My name is Beth Borrego, and I am Cruise Planners Travel Advisor. And tonight, we have a very, very special um, event planned for everyone here. We are going to talk to everybody about the Galapagos. Okay. Now, we are very fortunate to have Dave Huffman with us tonight. And David is an expert photographer. It doesn't get any better than, than David and his abilities. Um, so what we're gonna do is let David talk to us about all of the wonderful things that he knows about photography. He's been a professional lecturer for the cruise lines before. He has 40 years of professional photography experience, 20 years with Eastman Kodak. He's been a tour leader and author, he has like 14 ebooks on Apple Books. I mean, this is incredible. I, I don't know how he finds all the time that he does. But um, with that, I am going to turn everything over to David. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that, that wind up there. Uh, you know, it's easy to find time if you don't sleep. You know, that's, 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 a, that's the way to do it. So I'm going to share my screen now. I think I think we're good. Can you see that all right, everybody? We're good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm happy to see old friends and new. And tonight, this is the second Zoom call on our Galapagos adventure trip. The Galapagos adventure trip will be on Celebrity, and we, we're timing it at a really key time to get the right kind of animals and wildlife and the great weather available in, in uh, July of 2024. So it's far enough out, you can plan it, you can budget for it. So for the next few minutes, um, I'm gonna be taking off where our last one, our last Zoom started. Our last Zoom just one week ago was with the experts from Celebrity who talked to us everything about the ship, which is a knockdown gorgeous ship, only holds 100 passengers, um, as well as the destination itself, which was just wonderful. And I spoke for just a few minutes about uh, photography, but today we're gonna talk a lot more about photography. So you get a sense of the kind of assistance we're ready to give you and the kind of opportunities that this once in a lifetime destination has, all right? Let me, let me roll on here. Um, we already had a little bit of a wind up from, from Beth. Um, I just love helping people take better pictures. And I've been doing it for a very long time to audiences from one to 400. Um, the books that I've written uh, chronicle some of the places I've been and they also talk a lot about the photography and how to take better pictures in those locations. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I have uh, also photography courses available for download. They're either ones where you read along and then you get the assignments or what the newest one is a video version of that. So you can just sit back and relax and I'll speak to you through the, through the magic of the technology. Um, let me go on to the next picture here. Okay. So travel photography has some special challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that you're in a changing environment. It's changing by the weather. It's changing by the time of day. It's changing by the location. So you need to be able to access all of the settings and make changes on the fly in order to get good pictures. And I'll, I'll apologize up front. I'm talking primarily about adjustable cameras. Now, they don't have to be huge cameras like the ones I carry. They could be smaller ones, but I'm talking primarily about adjustable cameras. However, a lot of this applies to taking better pictures with your camera built into your phone as well. And by the way, I even have a free iPhone photo course I'll tell you about later. So the reason that, that it's a challenge is that everything is changing, lighting, composition, and the equipment. 
with adjustable cameras, you need to change things for exposure and focus and, and even the number of pictures you're taking at one time, whether you're taking a single picture or you're shooting continuous where your camera is, is chattering, taking many pictures at once. Preparation is really the key to get good results. For wildlife, you even have more challenges because you generally are at some distance. You need to use a longer telephoto or a zoom lens that will help bring that, that wildlife much closer to you. Um, in my case, I, I use a 100 to 400 a lot. I also use a 70 to 200 for that kind of use. And I even carry sometimes an 800 millimeter lens. Telephoto lenses need more accurate focus and exposure settings, by the way. So you need to be extra careful when you're using uh, a telephoto lens and you need to practice with it. Also, when you're photographing wildlife, they all have movements. You'll see them, well, for example, if you go to the zoo, you can, you can look at the different cages and you'll see the animals will pace. They'll have a certain route, they'll have a, they'll have a certain movement. You don't see that so much in the wild, but they do have a lot of movement. And that movement is something that you can prepare for if you observe it. So in most cases, wildlife photography, also uh, landscape photography means that you need to have some patience. You need to, to observe before you just take a picture. It takes a lot of practice, but practice is what makes perfect. And when you do perfect practice, you get great pictures. Also, these images that you take oftentimes need some amount of improvement after you've taken them. Straight out of the camera, pictures oftentimes can benefit from changes in exposure, changes in cropping and composition. They can't always get it perfect right in camera, especially when you've got movements between yourself, between a ship or even, or with the animals. So they usually take some improvements. Uh, we call that post-processing, and there are many different programs that are available. Some of them are very easy to use, and some of them are a little more complicated, but they give you control over that image, so you, you, you take a good image and make it a great image. Um, if you would like help in choosing those and using those, that's one of the things that I coach on, and you need to be ready with all of this before you take a trip. You don't want to buy a new camera and jump on a and jump on a boat for your trip. You don't want to try to just, you know, process your your pictures when you get home, not understanding how it works. You need to practice ahead of time. And of course, here we are. We're sitting in July of 2022. We've got two years to work together to get you there. All right, no problem. The Galapagos is a very special destination. It's an archipelago, part of the country of Ecuador at this point. It's about 600 miles west of South America. And that's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which means it has a lot of protection. It's a really a, a renowned um, national park. The islands emerged from, old, from undersea volcanoes uh, millions and millions of years ago. And thanks to a lack of predators, the wildlife that have moved there have no fear of humans and almost no predators. The park that you're going to be in when you get off the, the ship and we tender in and, and do a wet or a dry landing, the park has rules, you know, stay on the trail, don't interfere with wildlife, don't carry food, don't feed the animals, those kinds of things, because they want to keep it special. Um, and there are also no cellular or satellite phones. So it's a good chance to get unplugged and just have a good time. The weather is really excellent because it's equatorial all year round, but it does have two distinct seasons. From December to May, it's warm, humid, and tropical. The air temperature is average 79 to 85, and the water temperature is 79. So that's, that's uh, the kind of period that we're uh, that we're actually avoiding because they're uh, in the in the uh, not December to May period in the June to November time period it's a little uh, it's a little less uh, humid and a little more easy to navigate the history 
Uh, the first volcanic activity happened over 5 million years ago, and the animal life became about 2 million years ago. And these animals had to adapt to survive. This actually is where Darwin had his thesis for his book on the evolution, the origin of the species. He called the islands a living laboratory, which continues today. The uh, Ecuador took possession of it in 1832, and there are many different species. We'll look at it in just a minute. Uh, marine and land iguanas, turtles and tortoises, penguins, cormorants. In fact, there's a flightless cormorant, which is, which is a very unusual bird, only exists there. Albatross, there's other frigate birds, the boobies, the flamingos, hawk, mockingbird, finches, sea lions. That's, you know, there's all kinds of uh, very interesting. There's a, a great pelican. There's a giant tortoise, iguana. Those are the kinds of things you can uh, plan on seeing. And uh, as you can tell, you can get pretty close to them. You're supposed to stay at least 10 feet away from all of them. It, when you're in the water, if you're actually scuba diving or snorkeling, they'll come right up to you, especially the seals. They'll come right up because they're so curious and they don't feel threatened. So it's hard to keep your distance when you're in the water, but they will come right up to you. And it's very, they're very playful. Another tortoise, there's a blue-footed booby over on the right. And of course, these all, you can see the baby, the baby uh, turtles, uh, they're the hatchlings, um, will be there for the season. There's always something hatching. There's always some, some new babies out. The time period that we're looking at, we could expect to see uh, babies of several different species. And of course, in, when you're in the water or underwater, there's a lot to see. Not all, the, not all the great viewing is just above the water. You can imagine, take a look at like in the lower right-hand corner here, these people are snorkeling. How exciting is that to see that kind of clear water and have that kind of a tortoise right, it, right in front of you? Very, very interesting stuff. I myself would love to take a picture of a, of a whale breaching like the one in the top in the middle. I've never had one breach just like that when I had my camera ready, but we'll certainly give it a shot. And uh, the one down below that are actually hammerheads, uh, but we'll keep you safe, we'll keep you safe. Now, Beth and I are here to help you prepare for your trip. As the Global Travel and Photography Experts Group on Facebook, We'll give you advice about when to go, how to get there, what to wear, how to pack. You'll be very well prepared. We'll handle the planning, the logistics, and coordinate before, during, and after your trip. And we'll do pre-trip photography coaching one-on-one, -on -one, a little more about that in a minute. And depending on the on group size, I may travel along with the group. I have some of the courses I mentioned earlier available that help you know, know before you go is one of my trademarks. Travel with your camera, know before you go. Digital photography fundamentals show in the, in the center. That's, that's a read only book. And that one's now been produced in video format. So all the things that you wanna see in a video program are available there too. You just go to um, Apple Books, search for my name, or you can find the links on my website that will take you right to those books. And they're very reasonably priced, $9.99 to $19.99. Another series, um, Explore Bali, Explore New Zealand, On Safari in Eastern Africa. I have a new one I produced just a, a, a year ago about China. Um, so very, very uh, useful information. I'm generally putting around 300 high definition images and video in these books. And they're really fun to, to look at, especially if you have an iPad, because you can bring the, the image up full size. It's much better than a printed book. So last time when we were together, we talked about basic controls and settings. And we were talking about adjustable cameras. Now I've got some of those types of cameras in the back here. Some people like to travel with a very small shirt pocket or a coat pocket size camera. 
This one is actually an underwater and above water camera. And I've used it to take pictures just like the ones I just showed you. It's a small one by Nikon. Other cameras are a little bit larger. Some cameras, some cameras have uh, a fixed lens. Like this Leica has a lens that does not change, but it gives me great images. And because of that, it's a much smaller camera, smaller and lighter. Now, I even have a plastic cover that I put it in that's totally waterproof so I can go uh, snorkeling with this camera in the water. The kinds of cameras that I use primarily for the kinds of photography I do are more like this Nikon. This is one of the Nikon mirrorless cameras. This is the new Z9 model that just came out this year. Um, it's much larger than most people want to carry. I'll grant you that. The, can the lenses come on and off. I have multiple lenses that I'll take on a trip like this, uh, but it really gives me fine quality. Um, this is quite a bit more to know in all the settings for a camera like that. If you do have an adjustable camera, one that is a digital single lens reflex or a mirrorless, I can help you with all the settings. Doesn't matter the brand, doesn't model, matter the model number, I can help you with it. I also will take some other lenses. Um, here's for an example. This is this is a lens I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. This is a, a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. I get you, uh, I'll grant you that's still more than a lot of people would want to would want to carry, but it gives me the ability to reach out and grab that that far away wildlife and bring them very very close. I also have a multiplier, so I get the equivalent of 800 millimeters out of this. Well, that's just a, a few samplings of some of the things we do. So these basic controls are the ones I mentioned the other day that you really need to understand and know about your adjustable camera. So you can make any of those kinds of changes on the fly. If I'm there with you, I'll actually um, even call out. Don't forget to change your shutter speed. Don't forget to change your white balance. Don't forget to, to uh, set your aperture or your ISO according to the light but you can learn that on your own or I can help you. Now, when you're talking about landscape or seascape, this is a checklist and time doesn't allow us to go into every one of these in great detail, but I'll point to a couple of them that are rather unique for this type of photography. Uh, one is the shooting mode. For landscape and seascape, I generally want to use aperture preferred. So you're setting the aperture or the opening of the lens to control how much of the image is in focus. You want to generally have good focus from the foreground all the way to infinity. So it's nice and sharp. And the aperture preferred setting is the way to do that. You are generally going to be using F8 to F11 for your for your apertures, which gives you that increased depth of field. If it's a seascape, you may need a higher shutter speed if you want to freeze the waves, or some people will use a tripod and use a very slow shutter speed, oftentimes multiple seconds, in order to blur the water and make it look very creamy and smooth. For landscape, you're generally using the slowest ISOs in order to capture the greatest detail in the image. Uh, which is going to fall probably from 100 to 400 ISO. And you'll use auto or daylight white balance in most cases. If it's cloudy, you may switch over to cloudy. Um, those are some of the key settings you should use for landscape. You're not interested in taking pictures in rapid succession, so you're going to use a single exposure at a time. You're going to use your autofocus in a very deliberate manner, so you'll set a focus point which you control very carefully. Um, and you may want to use down at the bottom of that list, a circular polarizing filter, which enables you to darken the blue skies and to reduce the reflections off of foliage to increase the saturation or improve the intensity of the color in foliage it really helps. You'll also probably use image review, which means after you take the picture, the image comes up on the monitor on the back of the camera. So you can check all your all your settings. So that's a quick a quick uh, primer on on landscape or seascape photography. For wildlife, it's almost the opposite. 
you're going to use very long lenses, generally a 100 to 600 or even more. They could be fixed focal length or zoom lenses. And I'm saying those numbers meaning full frame or equivalent. If you're using a, what we call a crop sensor camera, a smaller camera, it, the millimeters may be different, but it's going to give you that equivalent focal length. You're generally going to use shutter speed preferred settings or the time value if you're a Canon shooter, because you want to control how fast the shutter releases, because you want to be able to control the movement of the of the animal and probably the movement yourself so you capture a sharp image which is a little bit harder to do with a telephoto lens higher shutter speeds will help reduce the chance of camera shake reducing the sharpness of your picture to make all that work you're generally going to use higher isos probably 400 up to 3200 even higher if you're really late in the day or very early in the day you also use continuous autofocus, so the camera is automatically focusing the entire time you have it trained on the animal. Because the animal is changing, you may even be changing the zoom setting in order to enlarge or reduce the size of the image in your viewfinder. And you want to have your focus always constantly changing in order to keep up. You also probably use continuous release. So when you press the shutter release, you're not just taking one picture, you may want to take three or four or five or six. The camera I have back there, I can actually take 120 images in a second. 120. That's that's like uh, six times as fast as the movie or a video footage would be. You also are going to be sure to use vibration reduction or image stabilization. So you want to have that turned on. Um, you don't really typically need a lot of, uh, of filtration for this type of photography, but you want to protect it because you may be in a, in a wet or dusty environment. So a UV protection filter is a good idea. And you turn the image review off so it doesn't slow down the action of the camera. So you're always ready to take another picture. For travel photography, as I spoke earlier, some of the things you might do uh, really depend on the scene, the lighting, the time of day, and where you are. Generally, you're going to use a wider uh, focal length lens to a short, uh, short telephoto. For example, anywhere from, two, from 24 millimeters to 200 millimeters is a good choice. And you're going to limit it yourself to one or two lenses because you don't want to have to be changing lenses often. You're going to use the program or the aperture preferred mode, and you're going to still use a minimum shutter speed of around 125th of a second because you're going to have something in that frame probably moving, even if it's just people walking. You can't get a, necessarily a sharp picture of a person walking if you're not shooting 125th of a second or above. And your aperture is going to be around F8 in order to give you more depth of field as well. Some of the other settings um, are, are a little less critical, but you want to you know, continue down the list when you get a chance to look at it. I'm also going to give you one more um, recommendation, which is a little bit out of my norm. Um, for this type of a trip, I would take a wet, dry backpack. Uh, the pack I use is by Aquapack. They've been in business for 30 years. It has a five-year warranty. It's only a little over $100. And it is absolutely waterproof. So it'll take all the equipment I've got in the back and then some. Um, and it has a very comfortable harness. So it's easy to put on even with uh, a life preserver, you can put it on. But the advantage of that is if you're going, say you're in a tender and you're going out for a, a wet landing, you don't want to be fumbling with your camera exposed while you're getting in and out of a boat or a kayak, something like that. You want to be protecting your equipment until you get to land. Then you pull it out and take your pictures and same thing on the way back. Sea spray is a particular um, concern, uh, even more so than rain, uh, because the way it can corrode uh, contacts in a camera. So, you, so I would recommend a wet dry bike pack. And I have a link here, which I can send you later if you want to send me a, an email. 
uh, that link will get you right to that uh, to that purchase uh, right at that uh, at that company. The coaching that I do is really one to one. Um, I coach on a variety of topics, equipment selection. Maybe you're thinking about getting a longer telephoto lens or you're changing, changing cameras with the brands, the cameras, the lenses, the accessories like I just covered. I, I give advice on all the different types of photography that I just talked about, as well as architectural, portrait, studio, all types of, of and, and genres of photography. Um, we'll talk about camera settings, photo techniques, because this is one-to-one, -one, it's really what interests you most that we'll explore and help you get uh, better at. Creative techniques, composition, lighting, color, exposure, focus. Oftentimes I even give an assignment so that after we've talked about a particular topic, you can go out and practice that. And in fact, the books that I sell that are the instruction books and the video have an assignment built into them as well. Um, and this is good for travel preparation or not. Even if you don't go on this cruise with us, I can coach you. And that's something I do week in and week out all year round. The charge is $100 an hour with a two hour minimum. We usually uh, use a Zoom call to be able to talk one-on-one. -on -one, and then I'll give you email support for 30 days after that to answer your questions. There's my email if you want to use it. Um, and, uh, and then we're just about done here. So what I'd like to do is open it up now for questions and answers. Um, Beth, could you take people off of mute and, and anybody that's listening, if you are, are in mute, would, would you go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to ask a question and then remute Yourself. I've also got the uh, the chat boxes. They're able to type if they if they need to do that or speak either one. Okay. You're all set. All right. So please let's if you have a question, let's uh, let's let her rip. I don't see anything um, as a chat coming up here. Any other? Any questions that you would like to ask about, uh, about our trip or about photography? Let us know how we can help you. Ah, we do have a, a question. We have a question asking, could we tell them more about the upcoming trip? Well, absolutely, we can certainly do that. So um, the trip is July 7th, 2024. And uh, David, do you mind if I? Sure, why don't, why don't I turn that yeah. back over to you? Okay. Um, thank you all for your attention. You have my email. If you have other questions, don't hesitate to contact us. And if you'd like to go to the website, you can find the free iPhone video and uh, some of the other resources I mentioned. Thanks very much. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen again. I've got you. I was going to say something, but I until the screen changed, I was muted. It's okay, Steve, what do you have? I'm still muted or no, now I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, <clears throat> was just curious about, um, I noticed the ISO settings and those are, are um, was for example, Kodachrome 64 back in the day was, what was the ISO on that film? 64. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. And then they made a, I forget the name of it, but they had a 400. Yeah. Yeah, Tri-X or, Tri or gold, gold 400, yep. Yeah. Okay, so and when you get up to the 3200 range, what would be the, what is the major change of that as those ISOs go higher? Well, a higher ISO means you're effectively making the camera more sensitive to light. So if you're in very dark picture taking situation, the camera will be, get, will be uh, adding more exposure to the sensor. Mm -hmm. if, 
if you're an electronics kind of person, what you're really doing is you're, you're taking the basic design of the sensor and you're adding gain to it, like turning up the volume control. Right. Um, uh, the more modern cameras, especially those in the last five years, can do very well at higher ISOs. And it also is a function of what you plan to do with pictures later. If you're printing them up to, say, a, a, you know, a fairly normal size, even the size I have here, which is a 20 by 30 inch canvas print, you can, you can use higher ISOs. There are also processing programs that can reduce the graininess or the noise in an image and increase the sharpness after you've taken it. Mm. So, but generally you're, you're best off having a good exposure at the lowest ISO possible, but you'd, but you'd rather have, and then this is especially important for, for animals, you'd rather have a picture that has a slight, slight bit of noise or graininess to it and be sharp than to have a noiseless, grainless picture that's not sharp. Right. Yeah, and, and I'm happy to go into more detail with you anytime about that. Hang on. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, I did not mean to do that. Give me one second, folks. <laughs> okay. This is what happens when you click the mouse too many times. Okay, we did have a couple of other questions um, about the the cruise and package tour package itself, and then also Sharice has her hand up. So um, about the the cruise and tour itself, the S three Sky Cabin, which is the the lowest end suite, this is the base pricing with the twenty percent off that ends July thirty first. Okay, so. Celebrity has on the celebrity floor this wonderful discount pricing right now. You can see very transparently here what the prices are and with the taxes and port fees. Now you'll notice you don't see any extras for gratuities. You don't see any extra charges for, for drinks or for Wi-Fi because it's all included in that price. It's all in it. Um, there's nothing extra to get there. Now, down below, you're also going to see the add-on pre-cruise land option, which you really need because it takes quite a while to fly in from the mainland United States. You have to come in to Quito and then come, you know, from there, there's another plane out to the, uh, the island where you're going to get onto the flora. So from the standpoint of acclimating yourself, getting to see Quito, you know, all of those things. Celebrity has done a wonderful job of putting together and curating this nice experience where you get to visit Quito. There's tour included hotel, breakfast, lunch, and a gourmet dinner with the group that's come in. So you're going to get to meet everyone that you're sailing with early and spend a really nice time having a wonderful experience. Then you get up, you're on a private plane that's just the folks that are from the group that are going out to the celebrity flora and you're flying out to where it is and then from there you're taken over to the ship to board you know on embarkation day on the 7th so um and you can see what the prices are now if you're going to get an air credit of 750 dollars per person to go towards your air it's air included but if it goes over 750 let's just say that it's like you know 850 there may be a little bit more that you're out of pocket yourself. Celebrity is paying $750 per person for that air. That's based on economy. Now, if you have, you're one of these people that travels a lot and you have a, a favorite airline, you have a bazillion air miles, you want to get your own free air, you can do it. You can see the package price difference there between, you know, if you take the $750 air credit or if you say no air credit, I've got miles and I really want to use it. So there's just a little bit of difference there in the price. Okay. Now the group space is limited. Um, the ships are small. So this is not something that you want to delay on because we, we also have a very limited amount. Okay. Um, and that pretty much covers that. Now, Sharice, I don't know if I, I see your hand is up there. I don't know if I covered what you were going to ask or not. So uh, feel free to jump in and ask your question. Yes, um, my mom and her friend went on a cruise vacation 
and I never been on a cruise vacation since pan COVID-19 pandem pandemic. I got my new job. I got a second job coming up and I want to save money, but I got my debit card. My social worker going to plan on a cruise. So what, what plan of a cruise trip is like spring or fall vacation of 2024? This, this one is a summer, it's July of 2024. Uh, this particular trip is going down towards the equator. Okay, that's, that's where the Galapagos are. So if it's your first cruise, this is a very luxurious um, event. Now, this is a double occupancy sailing. All of these cabins are, there are no solo um, prices. So this is the kind of trip where you're gonna wanna get your mom or your sister or your brother or you know somebody you know spouse whoever to go with you and pay that other fare because otherwise you know you're looking at the totals for guest one guest two and then there are your totals so you don't want to pay just for yourself alone the total for two people to sell you know just for you to sail solo just wanted to point that out since you haven't sailed before i didn't know if you were familiar with that It was a friend's to go went on a cruise that I'd never been because I had to save money. On my, I got my debit card with me and I need a passport, U.S. passport to fill it out so I can go on a cruise vacation. Me, my social worker, family support, and the other ones. Okay, okay. After well, I would also be happy to talk to you and make sure we can, you know, get you the right vacation for you since you've never cruised before. So um, I don't know where in the world you want to to visit. I don't know if the Galapagos and photography are the thing you're most interested in. It would, it's going to be an absolutely wonderful trip. And if that's what you want to do, then we would love to have. Are you a photographer? Do you like, do you like photography? I got my cell phone. I didn't have uh, binoculars with me. Well, I think binoculars are going to be something that people are, are going to want to have too. So, okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions right now? I, I have one. Um, I, this is a, a special savings from celebrity, but uh, it does require some sort of a, a down payment, but there's a, a nice grace period for the down payment that's that's refundable. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. And then I think we also had another question about uh, what folks are going to, what we recommend for folks as far as packing. And we'll touch on that too. Um, but in terms of the down payment, the down payment for this voyage is fully refundable up until final payment date, which is phenomenal. You know, um, there, there's no penalty for that. So you know, if you wanted to go and you made the down payment, then, you know, when it comes time, if something, heaven forbid, should happen, you can get your money back so long as you have not made final payment. Once you hit final payment, you can't get that money back and the rest of the balance will be due. So as far as packing goes, think casual. Think you don't need anything for formal night. There's not going to be a formal night. Um, Think about the clothes that you would wear when you're out on the Galapagos Islands on a daily basis taking pictures. So, you know, maybe you have some slacks or some jeans or some shorts some t-shirts or, you know, a sweater that you want to wear if it feels like it's chilly to you. It doesn't have to be fancy. This is not a fancy cruise. There will be delicious food. There will, the amenities on the ship are phenomenal and it is a gorgeous luxury ship so but it's right. a very dressed down casual feel because of where you're going and the fact that you're on an expedition does that answer the question In the, there's one other thing i would always pack and that's a swimsuit even if you don't plan to swim in the sea they've got a gorgeous pool and a spa this ship is only three years old and it is gorgeous. It is, oh, it is. So. And, and I priced out the lowest, like I said, I priced out the lowest, the entry level suite. They go up from there. 
but they're all sweet. They all have wonderful floor to ceiling views of, you know, what's going on outside. None of these are interiors, none of them, you know? Uh, so there, and there's something for everybody in terms of the size The none of them are little teeny tiny shoebox feeling rooms. They're all beautifully appointed. The whole ship is that way. Um, you're not going to find, you know, big, you know, casinos and nightlife and gambling and all these fun games and activities that you're going to find on the bigger ships. This is a completely different animal. There's a laboratory. So if they're doing scientific things and you want to, you're curious about the, uh, the wildlife, there's a lab for people who are into science. It's just a different feeling for a cruise. It's really more exploration. That's right. We actually, call these, we, yeah, we actually call these an expedition ship. Yep. And uh, Celebrity has a lot of experience with expedition ships. They actually have three different ships that they run in this area, in this market. One is much less luxurious and only holds 16 passengers, but this one holds 100. And I'm going to hazard to guess it probably has at least 100, if not 200 um, uh, staff to support you. So it's a wonderful experience. The question has been asked if there is laundry available on this ship, a laundry service. I actually don't know the answer to that, so I don't want to guess. But I will be happy to find the answer out, and then I can reach back out and let everybody know. These are good questions. These are really yeah. good questions. This guy, can you hear me? Yes. I was just curious how many days, once you've flown from Quito out to the uh, flora, how many days and nights are you on the flora? And is there a chance to get on shore every day? It is a seven night voyage and there is a chance to get aboard, you know, the shore every day. Every day there is, there is time ashore. Some days more than others, depending on where exactly you are. Sometimes you're coming in more midday and staying, you know, later at night. And some days you're there just, you know, you get up, you're there the whole day. And, you know, so it depends on exactly where you are. But yes, absolutely. Every day there is shore time. In fact, if I could add something, Beth, the itinerary actually has you um, oftentimes doing two landings a day. So you'll, you'll land and be there and be on one island for uh, a period of a couple hours. Then you go back to the ship, have a great lunch, and then you'll get back out and, and go to a different island. And they'll be cruising in between there. Yep. As an expedition ship and in this particular environment, the exact itinerary is, is one that that's, has some flexibility to it. They have to do that because of the weather. They have to do it because of the, uh, of the ocean currents. Um, so while they have a plan, they, they may vary from that plan in order to give you a better experience on the current conditions, but you're generally getting on and off the ship, I think at least twice a day, Steve. Okay. Good. Yeah. Oh, one of the questions is, can I show everybody the itinerary? If I was smart enough to figure out how to do that without managing to disconnect myself from the zoom, I'd do it. <laughs> um, I, I can try and David, if you can keep talking while I dig, I will be right back. <laughs> okay, well, how about we handle a, another question? Melanie, do you have any questions? I see Melanie there. The, the, uh, the archipelago ask, has uh, many, many islands. And the islands in this particular series are more of a, of a northern loop. They, they have a southern loop as well. And then they, they have some that are sort of a central. Different islands will have, um, are, are known for, for different types of uh, flora and fauna. So you'll find some that may have penguins and seals and other ones that may have more of the of the bird populations. That's just the way it's worked out. And there are chances, you know, to to get off the ship and uh, and snorkel 
And boy, if you like snorkeling, this is going to be a great place to snorkel. Not only is the temperature very, very reasonable, but you can, and they'll, and they'll, I believe they'll provide you a, a wetsuit if you need it. Uh, but I think you're going to see an awful lot of, uh, of marine life. It's really fun. Nice. I am almost there. Give me one second. I've surprised myself. Ha <laughs> ha. Good job. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay. There you go. Oh, there, there you go. There, there we go. go. There we go. Let me just drag it. Okay. This is what they call the 10 and 11 um, inner loop itinerary. And the 10 and 11 is based on two nights at keto on the front end and one on the back end. Okay. Um, so we were looking at 10 because we were looking at the two on the front end without the one on the back end. But that is the, the, uh, the itinerary itself, starting in Baltra. And then you can see the ports of call and the times in port. And I've got some other documents that I also went ahead and opened up. And I can just click the tab and flip over once everybody's had a chance to take a, a good look at the itinerary here. As you can see, I mean, you've got some really good time here in the port. You've got like seven, seven, like seven. Well, as you'll see here, you know, like each day you're actually docking at two different islands. Like on Monday, you're at yes. Regis and you're at Rabis both. So you'll, you'll, be, you'll be there from 7 to 11.30. Then you get back on the boat, have a great lunch. Then you go back out 3.30, 3 to 6.00. Yeah. And same thing, Tuesday, Wednesday. So you're hitting two different islands almost every day. Right. Exactly. And, and your total time um, on the ship then is going to be seven days. Mm -hmm. Steve. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. And so the wildlife calendar, well, I thought that you would all enjoy a little look at the wildlife calendar for, for when we're doing this, which is in July so here you can see what we're doing now we're early july so there may be a little bit of the tail end of june that will will come in there um but this is typically what we're going to see as a group when we're aboard the flora mm -hmm. whales dolphins mm -hmm. seabird communities are all active breeding Lava lizards initiate their mating rituals. <laughs> David said there would be babies. There will be babies or the making of babies. Um, nesting, I believe, takes place for the, the blue-footed boobies as well. Eggs, chicks, all of that. Little baby blue-footed boobies. I think that's actually what I'm most intrigued by are those cute little birds with the blue feet. If I'm being okay. honest about that. That's good. So I've also got the, uh, the Flora's deck plans here. And I thought that folks might like to take a little bit of a, a look at this. So here we go. As you can see, she's not real big. She's a small ship. And you can see that you have the, uh, the ocean grill and dining area here. There's an observatory back here. Um, you've got some wonderful open spaces. There's a canopy and stargazing up on this very top upper piece and there's another canopy. Then you have a lower area and it's really hard. S seaside restaurant. And then it looks like that's another that's the Discovery Lounge, is right here. Okay. And then Darwin's Cove is down on this, this area between where these two tenders appear to be. And that That's it. is the layout. 
The rooms look terrific, though. These are, yes, they're mm -hmm. phenomenal. So you can see the penthouse suites, the royal suite, premium sky suite, ultimate sky suite with an infinite veranda, sky suite with a veranda, and a sky suite with an infinite veranda. They're, they all have exterior views, all of them. You, you can't go wrong. And if you notice, for those of you who have cruised before, you know how small the balconies are. Look at the veranda. That's the smallest one is 88 square feet. Those of you who have cruised know how small a standard balcony is on a cruise ship. So, you know, these are very nice accommodations. I'm sure it's be very comfortable. It will be. And you can see here all of the things that it typically comes with. You have a personal suite attendant, welcome bottle of champagne or Blanc de Blanc sparkling wine. Full on suite breakfast, lunch and dinner service is available if you prefer to dine there. OK. Complimentary mini bar with beer, soda and water. Unlimited Wi-Fi access, 24-7 room service, which is nice. Laundry, so there you go. There's the laundry answer. <laughs> laundry service twice per sailing. We've solved that problem. I, I hope she's still on. Um, delicate delectables delivered to your suite. So if there, you want something on the delicate delectables menu, you can order it and have it delivered. Celebrity Cruise Cashmere Bedding Collection. They have that available. I'm going to say probably for purchase too. 100% pure cotton linens, pillow menu. So if, if you have a particular need, you like a certain feel for your pillow or you have neck issues or something like that, they do have a pillow, pillow menu available to make sure you get a proper night's sleep. So you've got luxury bath amenities, which is nice. You have 100% cotton bath towels, plush cotton bath robes, and bedroom slippers for use as well. I mean, it's, this just goes on and on doesn't it? And it's just very, very nice offering. You're treated like royalty. It's, they do. It's, yeah. <laughs> and like that's what you, you know, you come to expect from celebrity. Celebrity is a wonderful, wonderful partner for travel. They take great care of their guests and they do a phenomenal job. The service is top shelf too. By the way, I don't know if I told you, Beth, but I was looking at the flights and from Atlanta, it's, it's only averages to be a six hour flight down to Quito. So it's, it's even shorter than going to some, for, for me, than going to uh, Europe. And the prices were very reasonable too. I think the prices that, that, uh, that I saw online, I could easily cover with the uh, allowance that they have for the 10, for the 10 night uh, uh, cruise package. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think we also had a, a question about, uh, about seasickness. Um, of course, I'm going to say that, uh, you know, it's a smaller ship and it's going, the, the itinerary looks much tighter. You're starting and you're, you're going in around those little islands. So I, I don't see a whole lot of real open ocean voyaging going on there. Um, that, that may be a benefit. I would still do things like have the ear patch, the wristbands, you know, um, any of the things that you typically do when you voyage, if you are prone to motion sickness, I would make sure that you have with you. And if it means that you need to pick a cabin that is a little bit more centrally located, it may have a higher price point. Um, not 100% sure about that. Let me just take a quick look back deck plan. Folks, I'm going to turn into a pumpkin at five o'clock, so I've got to run. Okay. Well, thank you right. for the for, thanks for everything. I appreciate it. You're sure. very welcome. Let's catch up soon, Steve. We'll do, Dave. Good to see you. Hope okay. to see you on the cruise. Me too. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. So going back to the uh, about the, the seasickness, um, we'd have to look if if you want to go on the voyage, we could certainly look at the cabins that are available and, and see where you might feel most comfortable. Um, but I don't know that you're going to have a bad cabin on that ship. I really don't. It's a small ship and it runs pretty tight to its course. 
and, and the more the more modern ships have really good stabilizers built into yes, them. Yes, they really do. So that really helps. It really helps. So yeah, I see one other question up here uh, from Melanie asking about lightest camera lens combo. I'd recommend. It, it depends what you want to what you want to use. It's not so much about the lightest, but what you want to use it for later. Are you trying to make pictures to put in an album, maybe a digital album, or are you looking to put prints on a wall? Uh, but some of the cameras that are available are literally no no larger than this that have a tremendous zoom lens built into them. We call those bridge cameras. So that that could be a camera that might appeal to you. And if, you, if you'd like to follow up with me on my email, I'll uh, offer some of, those, uh, some of those ideas for you. Okay, Melanie? Does anyone else have any other questions? Okay. I don't see any other questions, so. Oh, Melanie's saying thank you. She hadn't heard of uh, what you just mentioned, so that's that's always nice. Sure. Well, e email me, and we'll figure out a, a way to get together and talk about this stuff. Absolutely. You're very welcome, Melanie. She's saying thank you, and that. that this has been wonderful. You're, you're very welcome. And we hope that you want to sail with us on this amazing um, opportunity cruise for, for photography. I think, I think it's going to be an absolutely fabulous voyage. So um, <laughs> she says, me too. Yay. Yay. So, okay. We are really glad that you have all come out to uh, meet with us tonight and learn more about photography and what David plans to do with, with photography and with helping everybody with their photography um, as we look at the Galapagos. We will post this up to YouTube and follow up with those who are interested in sailing. And we thank you very much. I'm Beth Borrego. This is David Huffman. Thank you and have a great night. Bye-bye.